In this last video for section 2.5, I want to present some examples of perhaps non-traditional vector spaces. That is, let's step away from the vector space Fn. Right now, we do a lot of things in Rn, for example, over the reals. Let's look at some other vector spaces, uh, what we actually might call infinite dimensional vector spaces, so we can talk about some subspaces there. I want to kind of diversify our examples so we have a more appreciation of what a subspace actually is. So the first vector space I want to talk about is going to be what we call R infinity. Uh, R infinity is going to be the set of all real valued sequences. So take, for example, the, the numbers x1, x2, x3, you know, going off towards infinity, right? And then y1, y2, y3, just examples as such. These types of vector spaces, uh, that is this R infinity, this, this, this collection of sequences, infinite sequences, this is actually, believe it or not, a vector space that was very important uh, for those who studied calculus two, uh, near the end of traditionally, the near the end of the semester in calculus two, you talk about sequences and series, uh, in which case the objects in play are these sequences, which are vectors in an infinite, infinite dimensional vector space. And then series are just integrals of those infinite vectors there. And so let's convince ourselves that it's a vector space. How, how do we know that? Well, if it's a vector space, we have to be able to add vectors together. So when you add two sequences together, you just add the first term in the sequence, you add together the second terms of the sequence, you add together the third terms of the sequence, and you do this ad infinitum. You just, you just go off towards infinity, always adding the, 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 the same terms of the sequence together over and over and over and over again. This is how we added sequence togethers in calculus two. Well, how does one scale a sequence? If you have a sequence of numbers and you have some scalar C, which itself is a real number, we have sort of like this infinite distribute uh, that's going on right here. Use times the first entry by C, the second entry by C, the third entry by C, and that gives you the scalar product of an infinite sequence. This is exactly how we did the arithmetic in calculus two. Is there a zero vector, right? What would, that, what would this zero sequence be? Well, the zero vector in this case would be the sequence of constant zeros. Every term in the sequence is zero itself. This has the property that when you add it to any other ve vector, any other sequence, you're gonna get the, the exact same sequence you started off with. And then all the other properties that are required for a vector space are satisfied. Addition is commutative, it's associative, distributive laws, all of that jazz works. This is in fact a vector space. Like I said though, it's an infinite dimensional vector space, a term that'll be much more precise in the future. Now let's talk about some subspaces of said uh, vector space right here. Let's take the, subsp the subset W to be the subset of convergent sequences. So when you have a sequence and we say it's convergent, that means it has a limit as n goes to infinity. I claim that the set of convergent sequences, because not every sequence is convergent, the set of convergent sequences is a subspace. Well, to do that, we have to check three things. Does the zero vector belong to the sequence? And the answer is yes. The zero vector converges just to zero itself. Uh, and so it's a convergent sequence. It'll belong to this, it'll belong to W. Um, what about the sum? Like if we have two vectors right here, X and Y, so these are gonna be sequences, right? Well, since X is convergent, we'll say that X converges to the number A, and we'll say Y, since it's convergent, converges to the number B, then X plus Y will actually, by limit properties, converge to the number A plus B. And so the sum of two vectors, sum two sequences, it's itself convergent. And what if you have some scalar product? What if you have a scalar multiple of a sequence? Well, limit properties from calculus two would say that this would converge to A times C. We just times C by the limit of the sequence right here. And therefore we see that this, the set of convergent sequences is likewise a subspace of R infinity. Another important example, we can talk about uh, W sub zero which is this gonna be the set of what we call null convergent sequences, which by null convergent, we mean that these are the sequences that converge towards zero, null convergent sequences. I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer right here to argue that null convergent sequences form a subspace of W and hence a subspace of R infinity. Let's look at another example, kind of generalizing the example we just saw a moment ago. We're gonna take the set R to the X, R to the X here, this is going to be the set of all functions of the form x going x is your domain and then your your range lives inside of the real numbers. Now x itself, we don't want to make it too mysterious. It's just a subset of the real numbers. And so for example, if we take x to be all real numbers themselves, so we take a function whose domain is all real numbers, that would be r to the r. Uh, r infinity that we talked about just a moment ago, 
is actually the situation where uh, this, this is really just the set R to the natural numbers right here, where the natural numbers are like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's all a sequence, it, sequence is. A sequence is a function whose domain is the natural numbers. So that kind of is just a special case of what we saw before. But these are things we talk about all the time in calculus. We want a function, a real value function. So we're just taking r to the x to be this collection of real value functions. They have a common domain. Well, is it a vector space? We have to be able to add together vectors. But as vectors are just functions, how do you add together a function? Well, the sum of f plus g, if those are two functions, is defined by the rule that f plus g of x is just f of x plus g of x. That's a well-defined rule. It gives us a function. And then scalar multiplication, how do you scale a function f by c? Well, you just evaluate cf at x just to be the scale of f of x right there. And so, therefore, this gives us a function space because uh, it's a vector space. All the properties of associativity, commutivity, distributive laws all apply to this arithmetic we have right here. And in fact, the zero vector in this space is the so-called zero function. It's the function that's constant zero, f of x equals zero all the time. So this gives us a vector space. Now a family, well, we're gonna give a couple of different subspaces in this one, but the first one, if we take, if we just take the set P to be the set of all polynomials with real coefficients, well, polynomials, their domain is all real numbers, so we can always restrict the domain down to be whatever x is. There's no restriction on what it could be there. So we could view the set of polynomials as a subset of r to the x, whatever the domain x happens to be. Because again, in particular, we could just assume x is all real numbers. I'd be fine with that. Then the zero object of this space, the zero function, can also be viewed as a polynomial. It's the polynomial where all the coefficients are just zero, right? That's the zero function. And so the zero function does belong to the set of polynomials. It's just the zero polynomial. So P contains the zero vector, which is just the zero function right here. If you add together two polynomials, you'll get a polynomial, you just combine like terms. If you scale a polynomial by a number, it'll still be a polynomial, just multiply each of the coefficients. And therefore P is a subspace of R to the R. And again, this R could be any X you want here. It doesn't make much of a difference the set of polynomials does form a, a subspace. And that's with no limit on how big the polynomials are. What if we do want to limit it, right? Take the set P sub X or P sub N, where N is going to be some natural number, and P sub N is going to be the set of all polynomials whose degree is at most N. So if you take like P3, for example, we're going to be taking constant polynomials, linear polynomials, quadratic polynomials, and cubic polynomials together. That I also claim is a subspace for the same reasoning. The zero polynomial is a constant polynomial. It'll belong to P0 uh, because the degree of the zero polynomial doesn't exceed X cubed. Uh, let's see. Then if you add together two polynomials whose degree is at most N, the sum will have degree at most N. If you scale, that doesn't change as well. So basically by the same reasoning as P, P sub N will likewise be a subspace. Now be aware, this gives us sort of like a family of increasing subspaces. You have P0, which is really, you can just think of as the real line itself. These are just constant functions, which can be identified with real numbers. Then you have P1, which is the, the space of at most linear polynomials. That, that sits inside of P2, which is the space of at most quadratic polynomials. This sits inside of P3, which is the space of at most uh, cubic polynomials. And this will then be contained in P4, which is contained in P5, which is contained in P6, all the way up. There is no P infinity, so to speak, but this set P itself with no subscript, uh, it does belong inside of this set. P, P will be inside of that. And all of these live inside of Rx. And so there gives you a lot of different, uh, different polynomial spaces in this situation. So let me give you one more family of examples here. So let C of X be the set of all real valued continuous functions whose domain is X. So this is a subset of RX. I claim by calculus, this is also is a subspace because the zero function is continuous. Um, sums of continuous functions is continuous. If you scale a continuous function, it's still continuous. Those properties of vector operations are retained by continuous functions. So CX will be a subspace of RX. Now, after that, let's define a new one. We're gonna call it C1. C1 is the set of functions which have continuous derivatives. So take a function whose derivative is continuous. Uh, 
Uh, so for example, that would not include like the square root of X uh, because although it's a continuous function, so this belongs to what we call C0 of X right here, say zero to infinity bracket. On the other hand, the square root of X does not belong to C1 bracket zero to infinity because it's derivative one over two times square root of zero it does have a discontinuity at zero. So it's derivative is not continuous, but the function itself is continuous. Uh, so we define C1 of X to be those functions with a continuous derivative. Well, by properties of continuity and derivatives from calculus one, the zero function it has a continuous derivative. Uh, sum of continuously differentiable functions is continuously differentiable. The scalar product is as well. And so C1 of X is a subspace of R to the X, which in fact, you can actually sandwich C to the X on top of that. Well, why stop with the first derivative? We can take the family of functions whose second derivative is continuous or whose third derivative is continuous or whose fourth derivative is continuous and define C to the N of X to be the set of functions whose nth derivative is a continuous function. Uh, by same reasoning, C to the N is gonna be a subspace of r to the x and in fact we could take the set which we call c infinity all right c infinity is going to be the set of all functions for which all higher derivatives exist and are necessarily going to be con uh, continuous we call these smooth functions the main reason is when you think of a function being differentiable right um, you can be continuous but not differentiable because you have like a sharp little corner yikes ouch a smooth function be one that has never these type of sharp corners not just on the original function but none of its derivatives will ever have these sharp corners as well and so if we take all these functions and put them together, we can see this hierarchy, right? So you have R to the X. So it's just all real value functions whose derivative is X. Contained inside of this is the subspace CX. Contained inside of that is C1X. Contained inside of that is C2X. Inside of that will be C3X, C4X, C5X, all the way up to CNX, it keeps on going. At the end of this infinite chain, you have these smooth functions, C infinity X. Well, examples of smooth functions include polynomials with no restriction on their domain or their degrees. Um, inside of that, you could have finite uh, degreed, like you top it off at like Pn or P2, P1. All of these, all of these are subspaces of this thing. And this is what I mean by it's infinite dimensional, right? You have this infinite chain, these infinite chains of subspaces. These are all distinct subspaces. No, no one of them is actually equal to each other. They're all sitting inside of each other, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so while it's not necessarily our purpose in this course for you to understand every single one of these examples, what I do want to mention is that all of these examples of subspaces allude to why linear algebra is extremely useful for advanced calculus. Sometimes it's called real analysis. Linear algebra is everywhere in calculus. So with the exception of those, and I should also mention that um, these examples here, if you take away things like cont continuity and uh, convergence and such, if you just focus like, you know, some of these sets right here that don't write anything on the calculus. You can also extend some of these examples to be infinite dimensional vector spaces for an arbitrary field. Uh, but ideas of convergence, differentiability, continuity, those calculus notions do require you be in the real number system, which is why so much focus is placed on that one. But we get a lot, a lot, a lot of different types of subspaces of functions in, in calculus. Basically, every object you were talking about in calculus is the is a vector in some vector space it just takes the right perspective and so with that perspective you start to see why linear algebra is such a valuable tool to solve so many mathematical problems calculus can be simply defined as the following we solve problems using linear approximations and then we take the limit of better and better linear approximations and that limit gives us the answer to our problem so calculus is just linear algebra plus limits and with that perspective, it really sells, sells why linear algebra is such an interesting topic in mathematics in general.